Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. Get your Bibles. You're going to need your Bibles, and if you don't have one, uh, borrow one, because um, you, you absolutely got to have a Bible today, because uh, we're, we're going to be using it many, many times. Okay? The question of the day is, what is the most exciting or daring adventure you have had as, as, uh, as a Christian? Carol was saying this year, you know, after, after having a terrible accident and... and Walking into the church. How many remember the day she walked into church? Oh my goodness! Yeah, that was a miracle of God. And uh, but uh, you, you know, you might you might think back, maybe the time you met Billy Graham, or uh, God supplied. Um, anybody else need a Bible? No. Okay, you, you you need a Bible. Okay, you're going to need a Bible. Uh, you won't get to heaven without a Bible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so something exciting. Maybe somebody held a gun to, to, to your head and could not fire it because God held his hand. Maybe uh, your car ran without gasoline because under the power of God. Maybe um, uh, you were deathly sick and somebody brought money just at the right time so you could go to the doctor. Maybe you were praying for a very sick kid and you felt the fever leave you. Leave them right there under your hand. Um, things like that, right? All of which have happened to me, right? Uh, it, it is exciting to live for the Lord. It is exciting. Um, so you think about some of the exciting things that have happened to you. That probably, well, you know they wouldn't have happened if, if you weren't serving the Lord. And I want to talk about uh, Bible action heroes. I don't know if you have a favorite uh, hero in the Bible. Mine is Joshua. You know, I, I, I just have always liked Joshua since I was a little kid. I, uh, all the things that he did, and um, yeah, maybe you like Moses or you know one of the others. Um, but uh, I, I just wonder, you know, think about that. Who's your favorite Bible uh, hero? Hollywood ha- can not even begin to come up with with the ideas of the stories that are in the Bible, the things that have happened there are incredible. I mean, they're out there battling, and they stop the sun. Wow. Hollywood still hasn't come, quite come up with that. That Superman movie where he, he, he turns back time, well, that was kind of close, right? But um, the, the things in the Bible are unbelievable. But, but we're, that's our heritage. That's us. We're standing on the shoulders of those giants. And that's what we have inherited. And the days in which we live require men and women that are willing to dare for Christ like those Old Testament heroes and the New Testament heroes. I, I, don't, I don't know that they lived in more dangerous times than we do. It, it's because um, we're coming down to the end. It's winding up, right? Anyway, so have your Bibles ready. We're going to have a, a sword drill. So there will be a prize for uh, for uh, the first person to stand up and start reading the scripture. Now, the, the first thing is I'm going to ask a question. Now, this is participatory. Everybody has to participate. Don't be afraid to participate. Um, I'll ask a question, and if you know the answer, stand real quick and, 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 and say it, and I'll try to 
figure out who stood up first, okay? You ready? Who said he wanted a drink from the well at Bethlehem when the Philistine army was camped there? Yes? King David. King David. All right, you win a prize. Here's a dollar. Come on up. We can put it in the offering. No, no, you can put it in the offering that you want. We'll see who collects more dollars today, okay? All right. The last time I did this, I did it with kids, and they were just thrilled. <laughs> the one with extra zeros? Okay. Okay. Now, you guys ready? Get your Bibles ready. Bibles closed. 2 Samuel 23, 15. 2 Samuel 23, 15 and 16. As soon as you get... you got to beat Richard. you got to beat him. If Rich, Richie beats you, it's, 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 it's a shame. 23, 15, 16. Yes, Roger. David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem, that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. Wow. Those guys were brave. They ran through, I mean, these guys were like commandos. They ran through the whole army to go get him a drink of water. You love your pastor that much? Mm. Okay, next question. Oh, you get a dollar. <laughs> okay, then we'll see what you want to donate it to or a down payment on a new house. I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, next question. Who ate honey from the carcass of a dead lion? Craig? That's okay, let's mail it. <laughs> Who was it? Samson. Samson. All right. Here's the take, 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 take him another dollar because he, he's old and he, he doesn't move too quickly. <laughs> okay, Judges, ready? Judges 14 8. Judges 14 8. Yes? Here you go, sir. Give, give him a dollar. She's the messenger. The, the messenger of blessing. All right. Next question. Who ran and beat the king's chariot from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, 40 miles? Who ran 40 miles? Yeah, Elijah. Elijah. Yes, very good. <laughs> give him a dollar. All right, ready? I was closed. First Kings 18, verses 44 and 45. First Kings 18, verses 44 and 45. That, that, that was quite a feat. Elijah was an incredible man. When you have it, just stand up and start reading. Really the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, Hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the day will stop you. Okay. Give her another dollar. There you go. All right. Can you imagine under the power of God running uh, and beating the chariot? And, and, and we find out later it's 40 miles. I don't remember if it says 40 miles, but it, it was about 40 miles. I mean, who does that? except under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's after he had called uh, fire from heaven and then took a sword and killed, I think it was 400 or 450 prophet, false prophets of Baal. He killed them. That takes a lot of energy to kill 450 men and then run, you know. Wow. So this part of the sermon I'm calling death-defying dudes doing daring deeds. <laughs> Repeat that three times real quick. Death-defying dudes daring things. <laughs> doing daring deeds. Even I got it wrong. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's, let's, let's move on. I had some more questions, but I'm going to... Uh, 
to go. Some of the other things that uh, that uh, Elijah did under the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, he, he pronounced a drought. It's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Can you imagine that? He stuck his finger in the face of King Ahab, the wicked king, and told him, all these problems are your fault. You're the one that's causing them. He pronounced the death of wicked Jezebel. Um, he was fed by ravens. Wow. God caused him to rest and fall asleep. And God sent him food and water. God's provision to a man that was obedient to God. Those are heroes, man. People that just do as God tells them to do. And God provides. Be inspired by that. That's, that's our legacy. That's who we're standing on. Um, at one time they sent two squads of 50 soldiers uh, to capture him. He called down fire from heaven. And they were consumed. Wow. I mean, it was not his time. And, and that's something for us to know. That regardless of the situation, it's not your time to go until God says it's time to go. You're in God's hands. You're doing God's will. You're stepping up for the Lord. Just being faithful. He is faithful. Okay. Uh, part two I, I call Girls Gone Godly. <laughs> Girls gone godly. Um, here, here's the uh, here's the, the question: Which woman led an army against the enemy? What is the name of the woman who led Israel? She was the general. David, you know, <laughs> Deborah. Yes, give that man another dollar. He's going to get, get a brand new car is what he's going to buy. <laughs> Deborah. And you, you remember why? Because the enemy was so powerful that the, the, uh, the general said, I'm not going unless you're going with us. Can you imagine? And she stepped up. Thank God for godly women. Okay, Bible's closed. Uh, Judges 4, verses 8 and 9. Judges 4, verses 8 and 9. Deborah was the one that uh, that led the army. Okay, uh, here's a here's an easy one. Okay, I think. <laughs> what was the name of the girl that babysat Moses when he was put in the Nile? Miriam. Miriam. Yay! Here's for your new houseboat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Bible's closed. Exodus 2, verses 3 and 4. Exodus 2, verses 3 and 4. step of the way, when he was born, when he was put in the river, when she, she watched him, you know, she, she, they didn't just release him and let him go, she was there. When when uh, Pharaoh's daughter came by, she was there and said, oh, I know who can babysit him, you know, and then of course they took him. Then 
They took him home. They took Moses home. He was raised by his mother and Miriam. When Moses came back to take the people out, the people of God, Miriam was there. She was leading. She led the worship. She wrote the uh, 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 psalms. She led. She wrote songs. You know, she, she was just one of the, the leaders that sometimes we don't get enough. We don't give her enough credit. Uh, all right, uh, Psalm 98, I think, is the one that's attributed to her. And uh, Micah says that she was uh, regarded as a leader in uh, Israel. Now, this one doesn't have a name, but um, yeah, let's see if you can guess who it was. Who told Naaman about the prophet who could hear him of leprosy? Who told Naaman about the prophet who could cure him of leprosy? A servant, a servant what? Girl, a servant girl. Who said that? You did. Give, give that woman another dollar. That's, buy another house for your kids. All right, Bible's closed. 2 Kings 5.2. 2 Kings 5.2. 2 Yeah, I, I, that, that's it. The rest of the story is there. But it was a, a young girl. We don't know her name. But isn't that just like like uh, like God? Uh, he oh, dollars. Oh, you make a good wife. Oh. Um, can we erase that part? Uh, um, <laughs> you threw me off. <laughs> Isn't that just like God to use people who are sort of like insignificant and do just a little thing that develops into this great big miracle where God gets all the glory? See, the heroes aren't always the, the, the star of the show, you know, wearing the cape and flying around and everybody looking at them. Sometimes God's heroes are very quiet. Nobody knows who they are. We don't even know her name. She's just a girl, right? God, God, is, God is incredible. Uh, okay, here's another easy one. From, uh, oh, this part is, uh, Bad Girls Club Turns Right. Bad Girls Club Turns Right. So, what was the name of the woman who hid the two spies? Yes? Rahab. Rahab! Man, he's going to get a fancy boat. Okay. Uh, Joshua. Bible's closed. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. So Joshua, the son of Nun, yeah. That's fun. There you go. And you know what? I'm out of dollars. I thought I had brought a whole bunch of dollar bills, but I'm, I'm out. So, <laughs> okay, we'll have to use hundreds. I'm just out of dollars. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one, okay? When Deborah's army, remember Deborah? When Deborah's army routed the enemy, how did Sisera, their general, die? Oh, that's what you're doing with all that money. Oh, gee. Okay. How did the uh, Sisera, the enemy general, how did he die? We were talking about bad girls done right. Yes? A tenth peg in the head. A tenth peg in the head by, by a girl. She seduced him to come on in to my tent, relax, take your shoes off, gave him something to eat, something to drink. The guy relaxed. She went and got a tent peg and boom, right through the head. 
<laughs> Those are bad girls who did great things for God. <laughs> God can use anybody. He used Rahab and he used this woman. Um, okay. Here's another, here's another um, uh, crazy one. This, huh? Oh, the scripture on that. I was checking to see if you guys are paying attention. That's all. Okay. Judges chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Judges chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Boy, you guys are right on it. Anybody? Judges 4, 17 through 21. You got it, David? Read it. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Azor, and the clan of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. <laughs> so he entered the tent. She put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. He drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Dude. <laughs> Don't be careful, not be careful. Okay, here, here's, a, here's a real crazy one. One of the great women of God. Huh? Who seduced her father-in-law so she could have a child from him? Who seduced her father-in-law so she could have a child from him? There are five women. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tamar and Tamar, yeah, yeah, that's right, give that man, he gets a little boat to go along with the, with the big yacht. There are five women in the lineage of Jesus Christ, five great women, without these women, there would have been no Messiah, and some of them had to go to, ex to extraordinary lengths and do daring things to turn out godly. This was one of them. You need, you need to read the whole story. Um, uh, we won't look it up because it, it takes the whole chapter. It's Genesis chapter 38. You need to read the whole story. And then read Matthew with the lineage of Christ. You won't see, I think you won't see their name um, I don't remember if you see their name or not because they usually have the man's name. Or is it in Luke that it, they do have the woman's name? I don't remember. Trust me, there's five women there. Rahab was one of them and, um, and Tamar was the other one. Without them uh, continuing the lineage of Christ, we wouldn't have had the Messiah. And the things they had to do. The way she was cheated and tricked and waited and finally did something about the situation, which was that to seduce her father-in-law. Can you imagine? You've got to read the whole story. It's incredible. I'm telling you, Hollywood can't come up with this stuff. Okay. Uh, the next section I call Lost Cause Losers Win. Lost Cause Losers Win. Okay, here's the question. How many lepers were outside Samaria when it was under siege by the Syrians? How many lepers? Remember? You remember? How many? Ten? Ten? No, no, no. That, that was that was. Uh, yeah. no, you're thinking one in the New Testament, yeah? Mm, no, we're, we're guessing now. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take that dollar bill and really make it go far. Uh, there were four. There were four. And the reason I say lost cause, because they were lepers. They couldn't be with their people. They couldn't go into the city where, where the people of God were, because they were lepers. They, they weren't wanted there. And they couldn't go back 
the other way because the Syrian army was there. They, they, it was all over. Nobody wanted them. They were doomed. And inside it was getting so bad that people were starting to eat their kids because they were starving. They were starting to eat pigeon dung. It was so bad. And they said, what have we got to lose? What could we possibly lose? Why don't we go and turn ourselves into the uh, Syrian army? If we live, we live. We get fed. If we don't, we die. We're going to die anyway. Lost cause. They went, but God provided a way out. He created this confusion. They got up. They killed, the, the army killed each other. They ran. When the four lepers got there, there was spoil. There was food. There was clothes. There was gold. And, and scattered for miles, all, all this stuff. And they, and the, they stuffed themselves. And they said, you know what? We're, we're, we're doing wrong. Here we are, you know, stuffing ourselves, and people are starving in there. And they saved the city. They went in to tell the news uh, about what God had done. And sometimes, you know, God will use us when, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? No matter what you do, you're doomed. You might as well trust God. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? These guys... Um, so if you ever consider yourself a lost cause, just nothing to give, nothing to contribute, except trust God. Amazing heroes, amazing heroes. Then there were other, other uh, uh, losers who became uh, winners. The demonic gathering. The guy was demon possessed, the man in the Gadara. He did tie him up with chains and he, he, was, he was so possessed he would break the chains. He'd go crazy. He'd go, uh, people were afraid of him. And it, it was the demonic uh, uh, possession on, on his life until Jesus showed up. And the next scene, you find him sane and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning. Dressed. Wow. Maybe one of the all-time uh, uh, losers who became a winner was, uh, was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. The Bible says she was a great sinner. From that, uh, it is implied that she was probably a prostitute. She must have been wealthy because she had that, that very expensive perfume. Seven demons. Jesus came by. He loved her. He healed her. He delivered her. She went on. What a winner. I mean, she followed Jesus. You know, there was a bunch of women that followed Jesus everywhere he went. Where when Jesus went somewhere, it wasn't just Jesus and the twelve. They had their wives, their families, some of them. And then there, it says that all these women would follow him. Rich women. Because the ministry has to continue, but it costs money. They had, there had, they had discovered you know, archaeological... Uh, of facts that, that uh, verify what the Bible says. I think it was Susanna, I can't, I can't remember exactly her name. The, the wife of the treasurer of Rome was one of Jesus' followers. And they ministered him. That is, you know, somebody had to wash clothes, feed them, you know, provide you know, all, all the other stuff. And all these women left everything to follow Jesus. Mary Magdalene. Then she was blessed. She was Standing right there at the cross along with the mother of Jesus when he died. They followed the body and they saw when Jesus was laid in the tomb, Mary Magdalene did. And then very early in the morning, she was the first one to go there to go visit the body. And the gardener appeared to her because the body was gone. Turns out it was Jesus. And something happened to her when Jesus spoke her name. She was arguing with him like, if you're the gardener, tell me where they've taken the body. Then Jesus said that magic word. He said her name. Mary. When he said her name, her eyes were open and she realized who she was talking to. It was the risen Messiah. You ever been in a situation like that? Where everything is so, so bleak, you think it's all over, even Jesus has died. And then he speaks your name. He knows. He knows who you are. 
um, Mary Magdalene, one, one, one of my uh, favorite. But here's the second question of the day. The first one was who, who, who are your favorite uh, um, heroes in the Bible? But the second question that, that maybe you've never thought of is, you ready? Who are God's heroes? Who are God's heroes? Wow! Can I tell you the answer? God's heroes are you. It's you and you and you. If you're like me, you're about to cry. That can't be true. That can't be true. How can I be God's hero? I'm a nobody. I really don't have much to contribute. I can't even find the book of Judges. <laughs> Second Chronicles 69 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the land, seeking to prove himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. You could translate that, that, uh, that scripture. God's eyes run throughout the whole earth looking for heroes. What does it take to be a hero? For your heart to be turned towards God. God's heroes are those who, who stand there day after day, week, month after month, year after year, and are faithful, are consistent, they pray for their families. They pray for their children. They pray for their church. They're there every time the pastor needs them. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, God speaking. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. God is looking for a hero to stand there and pray. Anyone can pray. Anyone can pray. I've learned something, you know, something this week that took me six decades to learn. God does not measure heroes like the world does. God does not measure by the standards of the world. And even in the church world, if you ever go to a minister's meeting, this is the way the conversation goes. Oh, hi, Pastor Bill. How are you doing? Pretty good. How is it going? Okay, great. Really? How many people did you have Sunday morning? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, and how many did you have? Oh, well, we were down a little bit. But, you know, it's vacation time. And because they're... We always measure each other and we measure success, how big a hero we are by numbers. It's just human nature. It's just human nature. But that's the way the world uh, measures. Even, even in, in the church world, we say, oh, that's pastor so-and-so. He pastors a church of 20,000. So what does that make him? He's a better pastor, right? Oh, that's Pastor So and So. He pastors a little church over in so and such a place. What, what are we saying? Mm, he's not such a big deal. Well, I'll tell you, he's a big deal to those five or six people that, that he ministers to. And he's a really big deal in the eyes of God. God does not measure greatness. And that's where you and I come in. He's not measuring us against Billy Graham. He's measuring us against our calling and what he has called us to do. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes and for all situations. Heroes are not always famous. We don't know the name of that girl that, that told uh, Naaman's wife about the prophet. We don't know who she was. And, and there are many people in the Bible that, um, that, uh, that God used, whose names we don't even know. 
did great things. 1 Corinthians 127 tells us what is required of a hero. Here's the one ingredient. You want to be a hero? You know you're God's hero when you, when you measure up against this verse. This is the verse. It doesn't matter if you pastor 100,000 members or 10 members. It doesn't matter if you, you're making albums and selling them by the millions or if you can barely carry a tune. The only reason you sing is to get even. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. He measures you by one thing and one thing alone. It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. He measures us by our availability. Our availability. Those are God's heroes. Those are God's heroes. And the first ingredient is, is faithfulness. A hero is faithful. 1 Corinthians 4.12 4.1 let, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. We are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We don't understand a lot of stuff. But we're in charge of it. Imagine that. We don't understand because they're mysteries. But we're servants and stewards of these mysteries uh, of God. And here it is. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful. That's the only requirement that God has. Faithful. Faithful. James 1.12 Blessed is the man who endures temptation and his trials. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, <clears throat> the crown of life, uh, you know, we've always uh, assumed, and I did too, that the crown of life is for those who are saved. But the more I read, the more I, I, I just wonder, I, I don't know, I don't want to develop a new doctrine or anything, but uh, I, I just wonder, it says that if you're faithful, you get this special crown of life, called the crown of life. Isn't that, isn't that something? God puts so much emphasis and so much value and worth on faithfulness. Being steady. Being there. Being available. All the time. Because insistent. Through hard times and good times, ups and downs, you're there. You're there. You're there. You come in dragging the bloody stuff, or you come in leaping for joy. It does, you're there, you're there, you're there. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Faithful. There it is again. Faithful until death. So a hero is faithful. Secondly, a hero is available in time of need. This is, this is an amazing scripture that I found in 1 first, first Chronicles 12.32. It's talking about Ishakar. Ishakar was one of the sons of, of, of Jacob. Uh, I think it's Joseph, actually. And, and, and Jacob blessed him and said this of, uh, of, of him, that he would be... Um, uh, like a, he would bow his shoulder to bear a burden. And he would get a reward or a recompense. Again, for putting his shoulder to the burdens. First Chronicles 12.32 Of the sons of Ishakar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. Men who knew the times and the seasons. These were heroes. Do you recognize the times and the seasons we're living in? I mean, pastor has been going through Revelation for, for a year now. And we are there. We're seeing prophecy being fulfilled in the news, on, on, on television, in the newspapers. Everything is in place. We were saying yesterday, I can't think of one more little thing that needs to happen 
before Jesus returns. Those are the times that we're living in. A hero recognizes the times that he is living in. I mean, just the, 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 all, all, all the nations around Israel are lined up. Uh, the kings of the north are, are, are on the move. There's the one army that has 200 million, the only army from the east. There, one of the prophecies is that something will happen and even the sky will roll up like a scroll. Well, that never made sense until now in the nuclear age. I mean, how can one third of mankind be killed by a plague? Well, now we know. It's not that hard. Those are the times. Heroes recognized the time. Heroes overcome fear. It doesn't mean that, that you're not afraid. And uh, I, I'm going to end with, 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 these, with, these, um, with these final thoughts. Because I want to pray for you. I want to give you a scripture. If you are attacked by fear, take down this verse. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. He says it so tenderly. He understands fear. It is your Father's good pleasure. Man, it makes him happy to do nice things for you. If you're going through financial need, you're having a hard time being a hero for God because of financial need, take down the scripture. Deuteronomy 8, 18. The whole verse, because it, everybody quotes the first part of it. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Okay, it comes from the Lord. But four, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Let's turn it around. So that the gospel can go forward, it is God who gives you power to obtain wealth. Just, just, it's the same equation. We just need to put it in front for our benefit. If, if, if you, that was Deuteronomy 8, 18. If, if you have financial need, God will supply your need if you think in terms of what about the kingdom of God. Put the kingdom of God first. Seek the kingdom of God first. If you get this money, if God meets his financial need, how will that help the kingdom of God? You get that mindset, then it becomes his problem. It becomes his problem. Weariness. You ever get tired? <laughs> it's been carrying the burden so long. You've been faithful so long. And you still don't see your family saved. Things haven't changed. You're just tired, man. You're carrying the load. 1 Peter 4.19 is for you. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. That's 1 Peter 4.19 along with Galatians 4, 6, nine, which we know. Let us not be weary in doing well, for in due season we will reap. If we faint not, you hang in there. Again, there's the faithful. 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 If you suffer in trying to be a hero, Satan comes against you. And I mean, there are real demonic attacks. Remember 2 Corinthians 10.4. Remember that, 2 Corinthians 10.4. Write it down. Put it on your refrigerator. Claim it. Memorize it. And use it. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. But our weapons are mightier and stronger. Satan has 
nothing on us. When he comes against you, use scripture. Pull down the stronghold. It starts in the mind to pull down arguments and every thought, bring it into captivity. There's, some, there's no sense arguing with that uh, renegade son, with that reluctant daughter, with that spouse that, that won't come back to God. Go in your room and pull down strongholds. It's a spiritual battle and the weapons of your warfare are mighty. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, the word of God, the power of your testimony. Those are the weapons that we have. Use them. Speak to the spirit. Speak to the inner man of the other person. You can argue to the blue in the face. Argue, even winning the argument is not going to solve the situation. That, that's not the answer. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual. Know that. Ah, physical problems. Physical problems. Oh, I forgot something. Ah, I forgot to bring it this morning. Of all things, overall. Pray for my memory. <laughs> Remember the story of, of the woman, the woman uh, with the issue of blood? And she said, if I could only get to him and touch the hem of his garment. She was referring to Malachi 4.2 where it says, but to you who fear my name, those who reverence God, the Son of Righteousness which shall arise with healing in His wings. And that, you know, that, that, uh, that prayer shawl, that talit that they wear, uh, I forgot to bring it. Uh, down, it. It goes like that when you pray. You carry it around your, your neck and shoulders, and when you pray, you bring it up. And that's the covering. As a matter of fact, when you pray, uh, when married couples pray, you, you, you bring her in under your covering, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's powerful. It's really powerful, the presence of God there. But that talit has these little fringes at the end, which the translation is correct. Now that I am a professional translator, the translation is correct. We're talking about the hem, the fringes. But the, in the cultural context, it's referring to the wings. That in, 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 they call those the wings, those fringes were the wings. And she thought, if I can only get to her, she was referring to the scripture. If I can touch the wings, I shall be healed. Because it says that the son of righteousness, righteousness shall uh, arise with healing in his wings. Isn't that something? I'll try to bring it one of these days, or when you come to the house, you can see it. And uh, it, it's powerful. It's powerful when you realize that what she was doing, she was claiming scripture for her healing. She had done everything else she could do. She was reaching out to God once she heard that, that, that the Messiah said, this guy be the Messiah. This has to be him. Helps to know scripture. Helps to know scripture. So if you're suffering physically, as so many uh, of us do, Take that scripture. There's healing in his wings, the touch of Jesus. And you say, man, but I've been suffering with this for so long. The doctor said, I'm going to die of it. There's your healing. Remember, <laughs> this is not our destination. This is not our destination. I went to administer... Um, communion to my niece who is right on the edge of, of uh, passing into the next life. And uh, there was no joy, there was no sadness. She ministered joy and healing as if we took communion because she understands that her healing will be complete with the next step. If you've ever been to that point where you can look to the other side. You don't even want to be healed over on this side. You want to get over there. God is faithful. God is faithful. 
And he helps us in all our infirmities, even the physical ones, where we just can't carry on anymore. Josh, you want to come back and lead us into the throne of grace? And, uh, I brought some, some anointing oils. If while we're doing worship, you would like uh, to be anointed with the symbol of the Holy Spirit, with, with oil, uh, come, on, uh, come on over here and uh, I'll pray with you and anoint you with oil as we worship the Lord. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Amen.
We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626 914 3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.